You know, I, we uh, mentioned the coerced and forced abortions, and this too is something that m not many people are aware of, uh, the extent of, of the uh, violence against women. Our next speaker will give us a little more insight. Molly White is the founder and director of Women for Life International USA a grassroots networking organization dedicated to defending life and motherhood against global political assault. As an expert in the history of the reproductive rights movement which led to legalized abortion, her work includes leading the largest international pro-life lobbying teams to educate delegates and UN ambassadors on the harmful effects of abortion at the annual United Nations Commission on the Status of Women Conference. Molly White. How can you do this to your mother and your father? How can you possibly raise another child? If you have this baby, your daddy and I will not help you anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, those are some of the statements my parents said to me when I was pregnant with my second child. And these are not uncommon words spoken to young women. Today I'm going to, my name is Molly White, and today I am going to talk about how legal abortion leads to violence against pregnant women and is the leading cause of exploitation of pregnant women. On November 25th, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon issued a statement commemorating the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, saying millions of women and girls around the world are assaulted, beaten, raped, mutilated, or even murdered in what constitutes appalling violations of their human rights. From battlefield to home, on the streets, at school, in the workplace, or in their community, up to 70% of women experience physical or sexual violence at some point in their lifetime. As many as a quarter of all pregnant women are affected. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time a UN official has mentioned pregnant women and violence. And I'm hoping that it may be due to some of our efforts and our formal complaints that we have issued to the United Nations complaining about violence against pregnant women. Let me give you some cases. October 2008 in Queens, New York, Derek Reed, 38, brutally stabbed to death his pregnant girlfriend, Naisha Delane, on the due date of their child. The reason for this brutal act, she refused to have an abortion. Reed became enraged at the imminent birth of the baby and stabbed Delane in the stomach and torso over 20 times. Their full-term baby suffered five stab wounds and died with Delane. On October 1, 2009, in Broward County, Florida, Stephanie Rabsat, eight months pregnant with a son she named Jaden, was shot to death by the father of her child, Edward Jermaine Babs. Rabsat sustained gunshot wounds to her abdomen and head. Babs had been pressuring Stephanie to abort their child. According to police reports, her refusal to have an abortion was triggered to the, triggered the murder. There are many more cases in my statement in your media packets. These are just a few of the tragic cases involving homicide of pregnant women who refuse to have an unwanted abortion. Since the legalization of abortion on demand in America, violence against pregnant women has increased. According to research, homicide is the leading cause of death overall for pregnant women. Not, not maternal mortality, not anything else that they're saying at the United Nations level. It's homicide is the leading, leading cause of death of pregnant women. Research, research also shows that pregnant women are at an increased risk of being physically attacked or murdered. In many cases, women were, who were assaulted were assaulted or killed for refusing to abort or because the attacker did not want the, the baby. A high percentage of women who experienced violence while pregnant reported being punched or kicked in the abdomen, usually by the father of the unborn baby. These findings add to a growing body of evidence linking domestic violence and abortion. Another consequence of legalized abortion is the use of pressure from others to gain an abortion decision from an unwilling pregnant woman. The pro-choice argument is that abortion should be between a woman and her doctor. That sounds good but it's not reality. Reality is that pregnant women are often coerced, forced, or pressured by others to have an unwanted abortion 
myself included. In one study of women who had, an experienced, who had experienced abortion, 64% reported they were pressured by others to abort. More than half of these women said they felt rushed or uncertain about the abortion decision. And more than 80% said that they did not receive adequate counseling prior to the decision, which was also true for me. When I went uh, for my second abortion that my parents pressured me into, I told the doctor I didn't want to do this. I'd had a previous abortion. I just had a little boy, a two-year-old little boy at home. He knew that I did not want to do this, but yet he gave me no other options. He did not give me any help whatsoever, but said that I needed to continue with having the abortion. My, sec my first abortion when I went, uh, I had two questions that needed to be asked before I made the decision to abort my child. And those questions were, what is the fetal development stage of my baby? And are there any risks involved with this procedure? They lied to me. They said it was just a little tiny dot of cells and that there was absolutely no risks involved whatsoever. Well, when I learned the truth <laughs> during the ultrasound of my second pregnancy, I was devastated. It was a baby, not a blob of tissue, and I suffered tremendous physical and emotional complications. 3,288 women have an abortion every day in the United States. With these statistics, that means that each day, 2,104 pregnant women will be coerced into having an unwanted abortion, and 2,630 of these pregnant women will not receive adequate counseling, including screening for possible coercion, mental health analysis, alternative choices to abortion, information about fetal development stage of their baby, or informed about the health risks involved with the abortion procedure. This, ladies and gentlemen and members of the press, is clearly exploitation of pregnant women. Women who abort under these circumstances not only with regret and suffer from the emotional and physical trauma, but also feel victimized and, and powerless. And that is why I submitted my testimony to the state of Texas in defense of the ultrasound bill because I felt victimized by the abortion industry. And in that statement, I said that I felt like uh, my needs were not as more important than their financial gain. That, and it makes women feel powerless, not powerful. Pregnant teens are the most vulnerable to coercion and experience um, and pressure with the highest rates of violence. Abusers are typically the father of the child, the teen's own family member, sexual perpetrators, school teachers, school counselors, coaches, employers, and in many cases, abortion practitioner personnel. Teens are often threatened to be kicked out of their homes or forced to leave their homes when their parents find out about the pregnancy and if the teens refuse to abort. And you heard about uh, Mr. Parker talking about the Center Against Forced Abortion, which is a very needed organization. Let me tell you one such case of a teen in forced abortion. It, it involves a young woman from Houston, Texas. She reported that her mother forced her to have an abortion by making her take over-the-counter drugs, probably either the dangerous mifepristone abortion pill or misoprostol, which causes contractions and frequently induces birth. After the teen gave birth prematurely at the family's home, the mother took the body of the baby and buried it in their backyard. The girl did not know whether the baby was dead or alive at the time. Police have investigated the case and may have discovered the baby's body, but won't release further details about evidence they collected. And there's many more stories that I have in my media packet. I've heard and in some cases witnessed reports of many pregnant teens and women being forcefully escorted into an abortion clinic by boyfriends, parents, and abortion clinic escorts. Often when women or teens resist such bullying, they are hit, slapped, even punched in the stomach or face. Abortion clinic personnel often do not report these abuses and thus become part of the exploitation and victimization of women. Pregnant women and teens have the right to be protected from such abuses, and they have the right to full disclosure of information about abortion. Abortion clinic doctors and staff who aid and abet forced, coerced, or pressured abortions should be held accountable to the highest measure of law. 
Women also have the right to change their minds at any time during the abortion decision. Like I tried, tried to change my mind and I was lied to that it was too late. I've heard many stories from women who said they changed their mind about going through with the abortion but were convinced by the doctor and abortion clinic staff that they had to go through with the procedure, only to learn later that they had been deceived. Abortion-related abuse does not stop here. The abortion industry in the United States is the most under-regulated medical industry. As a result, pregnant women's lives are being put in jeopardy by substandard health and safety operations with abortion clinics. And I'm sure you're familiar with the grisly practice of Philadelphia abortion doctor Kermit Gosnell. On January 19, 2001, Gosnell was charged with eight counts of murder and several of his staff at the abortion center, including his wife and sister-in-law, have been charged as well in the cases with assisting in botched abortions, practicing medicine without a license, or covering up the actions of those who did. And I have a very good grand jury report in my uh, statement. Filthy clinic and medical instrument conditions, botched abortions, neglect of care for emergencies that arise during abortion procedures, neglect and follow-up care, abortions performed by unlicensed staff members, and infanticide after a baby is aborted alive are common complaints of abortion pa patients that are being ignored by legal and medical institutions and feminist organizations. I consider these abuses violent acts against women. These abuses will continue as long as no one intervenes and we will carry the blame. In conclusion, the most disgraceful act of violence against pregnant women caused by legal abortion is the number of women who have died from the so-called safe procedure. Instead of legal abortion saving women's lives, women are dying from botched and risky abortion procedures. I'm going to wrap up and there's a whole lot of information in there about the number of women who are dying. Ladies and gentlemen and members of the press, I propose that we take a renewed look at the issue of abortion for what it really is. It's a violent act against pregnant women. Abortion has been sold to us as an empowering women's rights tool and a cure-all for unplanned pregnancies. What abortion really is is the mass weapon of destruction that has cost the lives of millions of babies in the womb and led to the deaths of hundreds of pregnant women and the sorrow and regret of millions of post-abortive women men and family members. Legal abortion has led to a decrease in the value of all human life and an increase in violence against pregnant women and girls. Instead of looking at the cause of why women had legal abortions and overcoming those obstacles, the legalization of abortion has become a snare around our necks. Can't we as intelligent thinking individuals come, with, come up with a better, healthier, and life-affirming choices for women? Thank you. So much for choice, huh? When you consider that statistics, 64% of women say that they were coerced or forced to choose abortion. 